Thank you very much, Virginia. I apologize that I won't be able to speak to you in Spanish, I'm afraid. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's, uh, I'd like to begin by thanking for Virginia for giving me the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I think it's about three years since I was last here, so it's very nice to be here again. And uh, I'm going to talk about bird migration. And what I'll be talking about is only partly, a small part is my own research. Uh, the other will be in the nature of a review because what I want to do is to review really what our current understanding of bird migration is on some of the, the aspects of the subject. Um, well, bird migration, of course, uh, is often defined as a regular return movement that birds make between their breeding and their wintering areas. And migration occurs not just in European climates with warm summers and cooler winters, it occurs in the tropics, as you all know, with regular wet and dry seasons. In fact, migration occurs in any seasonal environment in which bird food supplies change predictably from abundant to scarce during the course of each year. Uh, mostly, of course, the birds move from high to lower latitudes for the winter. Well, uh, those of you who work on birds will be familiar with the fact that you can take all the birds that live in this area and you could divide them into several different categories. You find that there are some resident birds that are present here all year round. Birds like the imperial eagle or the, in English, red-legged partridge or green woodpecker. You can see them here at any time of year. You'll have a second category of summer visitors. These are birds that come in to breed. Birds like swallows, or bee eaters and many others that you only see during the summer months. And you'll also have just winter visitors, birds that come here to spend the cold season from northern latitudes. Birds like many species of ducks or shorebirds are in that category. And you'll also have passage migrants. These are birds that you'll only see during the spring and autumn as they travel between breeding areas to the north of here and wintering areas to the south. Birds like the wimbrel, for example, or the arctic tern, uh, or sedge warbler, quite a number of species in that category. And lastly, that could be the biggest category of all, uh, these are what we call partial migrants. These are birds that occur in the area and part of the population migrates each autumn, but part of the population stays here year round. But the two sectors of the population interbreed here during the summer and uh, I, I, not living here I don't know of any examples of partial migrants but I asked uh, Miguel Ferrer last night and he told me probably robin and probably blackbird are in this category where uh, some birds stay and other birds migrate. Well why do birds uh, migrate? Why do they bother? Well, the answer to that question is, I think, uh, obvious from this picture, which is taken in my home village in winter. That's not my house, by the way, there. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> birds, uh, or migration, is assumed to occur whenever birds benefit from leaving their breeding areas for a period rather than staying there year-round. And the usual reason that breeding areas become unsuitable during part of the year is, of course, lack of food. Uh, as plant growth usually stops for part of the year, or at least it does over most of Europe, and many prey animals that birds would eat, they either die off or they hibernate uh, or they become inaccessible under snow or ice. Now, in the case of these hooper swans, for example, uh, the lakes, these are birds that breed in Iceland and they come to Britain for the winter. But in the, their case, the lakes where they breed freeze over in the winter, so they've no choice of staying there then. And in the case of uh, the swallows, for example, the aerial insects on which they depend become unavailable in winter. And at high latitudes, as you go further north in Europe, day lengths also is shortened in winter to such an extent uh, that many diurnal birds would have insufficient time to get enough food in a day, even if food were available. So the reason why many birds move southward to lower latitudes in the winter or in the autumn is, I think, fairly obvious. But a much more difficult question, I think, is why they bother to come back again in spring. 
because many of them uh, winter in areas like uh, Africa, for example, uh, in areas that seem perfectly capable of supporting them year round. But by returning north in spring to Europe and northern Europe particularly, they can of course exploit the seasonal abundance of food that occurs at high latitudes for a brief period in summer, as well as taking advantage of the much longer summer days, and thereby probably raise more young than they would if they stayed in low latitude wintering areas year round and competed with the birds that are resident there. <clears throat> so we can say that whereas the advantage of uh, migrating to uh, lower latitudes can be seen as improved winter survival, the advantage of spring migration to higher latitudes we can see as improved breeding success. And the assumption is that migration occurs whenever the net benefits of travelling both ways outweigh the costs of staying in the breeding area year round. But these are just plausible ideas. It's almost impossible to think of any way to test them experimentally, but there, are, uh, there is, of course, considerable uh, experimental, uh, not experiment, non-experimental evidence. For example, <clears throat> if you look at the geographical trend in migration in Europe, that's, as you can see, is the western seaboard of Europe, from Morocco in the south there, right up to Svalbard in the north. And you can calculate for each five degree of latitude, which is what I've done here, the proportion of breeding birds there that move out totally for the winter. Mm. And that's shown on these uh, pie charts uh, up the side here. So uh, even in the mild climates of Morocco, south of here, about 30% of all the species, all bird species that breed there, are completely migratory. But that proportion, as you can see, increases with increasing latitude reaching more than 90% uh, in the far north. That's as winters become progressively more severe. <clears throat> now, species that spend the winter in the far north, uh, where there's only at most a few hours of twilight in winter, include birds like the ptarmigan or this species, the snowy owl, or a few seabirds that feed at cracks in the pack ice where they can get to the sea. But the important point is that a geographical trend occurs uh, in migration which corresponds to the severity of winters uh, and to the difference between summer and winter food supplies. But whether particular species leave particular latitudes uh, relates to their diets and whether the foods they eat remain available at that latitude in winter. If they don't, then they move further south. <clears throat> Well, turning to the evolution of bird migration, you can ask the question, how did migration evolve and how does it change through time? And that question has been tackled on wild birds which can be bred and tested in captivity. And I want to just briefly describe some work by Peter Berthold, a German biologist, who was the first to really tackle this question. And he worked mainly on this species, which in English is called a black cap for obvious reasons. But the important point about that bird is not only that you can keep it in captivity in cages, but its migratory behavior varies across Europe. In some southern parts, I think in southern Spain, the bird is sedentary. You can find it here year round. But in northern Europe, say in Sweden or Norway, the population is totally migratory. And in between other areas, it's partially migratory. Some birds leave and others stay. But there's a big range of geographical variation within that species. And uh, as I mentioned, you can study the migratory behavior in cages. And one common thing, characteristic not just of this species, but of all birds, is that at migration times, providing they're on a natural day length, they show uh, what, what's become called migratory restlessness. They become very active hopping and fluttering around their cages when they're ready to migrate. And you, you can record that behavior by electronically by trips placed under the perches. So you can record the diurnal activity or the night and day and find when the birds are extremely active at migration times. And birds that migrate in the daytime, this sh they show migratory restlessness during the day. And birds that migrate at night, 
like this black cap, they become restless at night when it's dark. And I want to show you some of the results found by Berthold and his team. And what they did was to measure migratory restlessness. That's the activity of these birds at night. It's totally dark outside. Uh, and uh, a period over which they showed that restlessness. And this bird here is a black cap from the Canary Islands, the southern part of the range. And you can see that that bird showed not very intensive migratory restlessness and over a short period of time. Whereas the bird up here, that's a bird from Sweden, kept in similar conditions, and that showed much more activity and over a much longer period of time. So there's a difference between these birds according to where they live and according to where they migrate. And what Berthold did was to take birds from that population and from that population and he hybridized them in captivity. And that's the pattern of behavior that you get in the hybrids. You can see it's exactly intermediate in the intensity of the behavior and in its duration. Now this was, at the time, this was an amazing result because it, it confirmed that migratory behaviour in birds was inherited. It's passed from uh, parent to offspring. And that's true of the intensity of the behaviour and the timing and the duration. And the duration of that behaviour in captivity correlates with the duration of migration in the wild and the distance that the bird travels. Now, another aspect of migration studied in the same species is migration directions. And in the western part of Europe, the western half of Europe, all individuals of that species migrate towards the southwest, towards Gibraltar. And they pass at the Straits into Africa at the Straits of Gibraltar. But the birds that live in the eastern half of Europe, uh, you know, from about this point on, they migrate instead of southwest into Africa, southeast into Africa, crossing into Suez there. So there's differences in directions in different parts of Europe. And uh, this is some work by Andreas Helbig, who was one of Berthold's students. And what he did was to get birds from Western Europe, which is shown by these dark triangles here, and birds in, uh, from Eastern Europe, which is shown by these uh, white triangles here. And you can test the migratory directions of birds again in captivity by putting them in a cage with a wire top outside so they can see the night sky. And at migration seasons they go in the cage in the direction that they would normally migrate. So you can get their preferred directions. And all this here, these here are directions of different individuals from Western Europe. And you can see they all headed between west and south. The average direction was southwest towards Spain and Gibraltar. And these are all birds from Eastern Europe. They showed quite a lot of spreading migration directions, but again, the average was towards the southeast. And what Helbig did again was to take birds from different parts of Europe and hybridize them. And all around the bottom here, these are all the hybrids. And you can see that there's a very big spread of migration directions in the hybrids, but the average direction was again more or less midway between that of the two parent populations. So that indicated that it's not only migratory intensity that's inherited, but also migratory directions. Now, for a bird to head in the right direction, of course, it needs a compass. And we all know from experimental work that birds can use the sun or the stars or the Earth's magnetic field to find the right direction where their inherent instinct tells them they must head. Uh, but I won't go into that uh, in any detail, but of course the bird has to be capable of reversing that direction in spring when it returns to its breeding area. <clears throat> so it's not just these major aspects of migratory behaviour in birds that are inherited and genetically controlled. It's also other aspects uh, like migratory fattening. Yes, I'll just go back to the, the work on inheritance. The other thing that uh, uh, Berthold's team did was to get black caps from a population that were partially migratory. Uh, it, the scale here goes from 0 to 100. That's no migratory birds in the population, 100% resident, 
to 100% migratory in the population. And they started in the population where about 20% of the birds showed migratory behavior in cages. And what they did was to test the birds and then they'd breed them in captivity. And from one generation, they would select out the least migratory ones, those that showed least migratory behavior. Uh, and that was the, the results they got in the next generation. From those, they would again select the least migratory ones, and that was the result they got in that generation. So over the generations, you can gradually select from a mi partly migratory population to get eventually, after five or six generations, a totally resident paper as population as judged by their behavior in captivity. Going the other way, they picked out the most migratory birds and selected that in, in about four generations. They went from that situation to a, a fully migratory uh, population. So this gave us some ideas of how birds might respond to natural selection in the wild. Of course, it would take longer in the wild than it does here, and it would take longer in long-lived birds than short ones. But it just indicate one way in, in which birds might respond to uh, climate change, for example. And of course, uh, lots of changes in bird migratory have occurred in the last 50 years or so. Uh, some species that used to be migratory are becoming more resident, they're not going on migration, or they're migrating shorter distances than they did, we know this from ring recoveries, or they're changing the timing of their migration, or even a few cases of them changing migratory direction. And I just wanted to give a few examples. These, I'm afraid, are all from Britain. This is a lesser black backed gull, which breeds with us, and uh, in the 19th century was totally migratory. They moved out of Britain completely for the winter, came down to the coasts of Spain and West Africa. But now, uh, most of this population is resident in Britain. They don't move at all, although some birds still come to Spain, mainly the, the younger ones. Similarly, that's a chiffchaff, a small warbler, which has started wintering in Britain in increasing numbers since the 1950s. And this is, uh, shows how the timing of migration has occurred. This is the timing of migration in spring, as noted by the average arrival dates. We've got two warblers here, and the average arrival dates, uh, if we go from 1960 here up to 2000, the average arrival dates fluctuate from year to year, depending on the prevailing weather. If it's a very early spring, they come early. If it's a late spring, they come later. But the general trend over these years, as you can see, has been for them to arrive earlier in Britain. And the same is true of this species, another warbler. But nonetheless, the two species have maintained the same distance between them, the same difference in timing throughout that whole period. So there are changes occurring in migratory behavior. And you know that living in southern Spain probably better than I do, and that you've got so many species here that used to migrate entirely to Africa, but now stay, are staying behind in increasing numbers in southern Spain, birds like white storks, for example, or lesser kestrels. Well, I want to talk about some other adaptations. And uh, it's well known, of course, that migratory birds put on fat to fuel their journeys. Uh, uh, this has been known for a long time from work done at bird observatories. But the amount of fat that the bird puts on, of course, correlates with the kind of journey it has to make. And this is a, a linnet, uh, breeds in Britain and, and also in Spain. And that, uh, on migration, travels short distances over land. So it has food available throughout it, its uh, migratory route. And this species, increases in weight at migration time by just about 10%. It puts on a relatively small amount of fat. But birds like this uh, sedge warbler that migrate from northern Europe into Africa, south of the Sahara, they, and crossing the Mediterranean Sea and the Sahara Desert, they put on a lot more fat. This is a photograph of a, a sedge warbler taken in the summertime. And uh, this bird is not dead, it's perfectly okay. Uh, I've just wetted its, its breast feathers and separated them, so you can see that's the, the, pe the uh, pectoral muscles, and that's the breastbone. And the fat that this bird holds in summer is that yellow patch there. 
and that is enough fat to allow that bird to survive overnight when it's not feeding and also take it into the following day in the morning. But that's typical of the amount of fat that that bird would carry for most of the year. But this is a sedge warbler about to set off on migration and you see the whole carcass of the bird, the whole body of the bird is completely surrounded by fat. That bird will double its weight. It goes from 9 grams to 18 or even 20 grams at migration time as it's ready to take off. Now it's calculated many years ago in the 1960s that these birds accumulated enough fat uh, for migration that they should be able to fly in one non-stop flight from Britain south of the Sahara without needing to stop. We don't know that they actually do this but at least we, we know that they have enough fuel to take them on a journey of that length without needing to uh, feed in any way. Um, well these birds uh, are wild birds but uh, in captivity birds do exactly the same thing so that gives us another way of knowing that a bird is in a migratory state by the amount of fat that it has. Uh, and these are some data from uh, sedge warblers showing their rate of fattening in spring. These are from Africa. Uh, the body weight of the bird is shown there. And the dates are given a lot along here. And these are birds that were caught two or three times while they were fattening for migration. And you can see the rate at which they put on fat varies quite a lot between birds. That's a fairly slow one. This one's an incredibly rapid one. Presumably depends partly on their food supply. But the general pattern is that within about 10 days or 12 days that species can double its weight and it can halve its weight uh, in about two days or three days. I've often thought of the advantage of knowing about a slimming aid that, in which you could halve your weight in three days. That would be quite a thing but uh, anyway uh, of course fat is the most efficient fuel that an animal could use, a bird could use. Uh, there are only three possibilities for any bird or any animal which is fat, carbohydrate or protein and I've just given here the energy per gram of each of those that it could get in kilojoules and you, if you compare the fat, a gram of fat with a gram of carbohydrate or protein the bird can get as you can see eight or nine times as much energy from a gram of fat and one reason is of course that fat can be stored with very little water, the figures are given uh, here. Only 5% water is stored in fat whereas carbohydrate, uh, that's mostly glycogen in birds and protein, that's muscle protein, uh, that's 70 or 80% of water which is partly why those tissues are much less efficient for energy. Now we know now that some birds on migration carry much more than migratory fat, more than fuel for the journey. Uh, some geese, like these Brent geese here, that nest in the high Arctic, uh, that the summer is so short there that it won't allow them to raise young within a growing season. They tend to get there, I've been there when they arrive, they get there while the ground is still snow covered and as soon as some snow free ground appears, as the snow melts, they start nesting. Uh, and and that's, still, that's way before plant growth begins, before there's anything that the geese can eat. And it turns out from studies in Holland that these birds accumulate sufficient body reserves in their wintering areas not just to migrate to Arctic Siberia but also to carry them about halfway through the breeding season. The females uh, produce eggs and you all know the size of a goose egg, they might lay four or five and they also have enough food to produce the eggs and to last the four-week incubation period because during the incubation period females hardly leave the nest. They don't really feed until after their young have hatched. So as well as migratory fat, these birds are carrying to their breeding areas enough extra body weight to last them halfway through the breeding season. That's six weeks out of the three months that they spend in the Arctic. And uh, one of the researchers on this, Bart Ebbing in the Netherlands, he was able to measure the condition of the birds before they set off on migration. That's a relatively thin bird, but that's, that's in good enough condition to migrate. But the really fat birds, the whole belly uh, 
sags down here, touches the water there. Mm -hmm. That's solid fat. And he noticed by recording the, the condition of birds before they set on, on the migration that it was really only the very fat birds that returned with young the next autumn. Only they were fat enough or carried enough body reserves to produce young. Many of the geese that looked like that, they came back, but they got no young, which is a, a, a signal that there's a big carryover effect from wintering to breeding areas, but the amount of body reserve they can accumulate in winter uh, influences their breeding success in the Arctic during the following summer. Okay, just a bit of historical stuff here. I just want to talk, say something about uh, how one studies uh, migration. At the start of the 20th century, uh, bird ringing was, of course, a major technological advance in bird studies because that little metal band that you put on the bird's leg, it carries a characteristic number. So for the rest of its life, a ring bird remains as an identifiable individual, as you all know. Yielding in the collective recoveries from many different individuals gives you information on the lifespans uh, and on the movements of individual birds because the ring also carries an address to which the finder can report the ring. And most of what we know about bird migration routes still comes from ring recoveries. But the problem with ring recoveries, and there are several problems, one is that the, for some kinds of birds, the recovery rates are extremely low. In Britain, for example, by the year 2000, more than a million of these birds had been ringed in Britain. But the recovery rate, it was 0.25. In other words, only one out of every 400 birds of this species that were ringed was ever recovered again. And most of them were caught back in Britain, so it didn't tell us anything about the migration. But nonetheless, we had a few recoveries, maybe a dozen or just over, uh, from that million birds, which show us that they migrate down through France and Spain and win probably winter uh, in West Africa there. But a second problem of ring recoveries is that uh, it's virtually impossible to get any recoveries from some parts of the world. People just can't or don't uh, report rings, even though we know that our birds must go there. So there are disadvantages in ringing, but nonetheless, it's given us most of the information we have. But another useful method of studying bird migration, of course, is observational, in that many people watch and count migrating birds as they fly by. But here, too, there are problems, because when watching migration, of course, you're limited to what you can see with your naked eye or the limits of your binoculars. Uh, and we now know that most migration occurs at far too great a height for us to see even with binoculars, well beyond visual range. And most migration also occurs at night when we couldn't see it anyway. Uh, and we know this partly for the use of radar. And I put this picture on of David Lack because uh, he was a pioneer in radar work. And he worked during the Second World War as a radar technician. And it was he who realized that the tiny little dots that you could see on a radar screen were actually migrating birds. Everybody knew they weren't aircraft, but nobody knew what they were. And the people who operated the radar screens, at least in England, used to refer to these dots as angels. But, uh, but it was he, or he is credited, with realizing, first of all, that they, these were birds, but more importantly, that radar gave us a, a new way of studying bird migration uh, that told you things that you couldn't tell by direct observation. Because radar, you can compare the volume of bird migration on different nights, you can relate it to the weather, you know the altitude at which the birds are flying, and you know the directions at which they're flying. So it's completely independent of visual observations, day or night. Uh, and it will also operate, of course, in all weathers. So it has none of the constraints of the people that sit on the ground with binoculars uh, looking at birds. But what it can't do, it can't tell you the species. You can distinguish by radar small, flying, small uh, slow flying birds 
from bigger, faster flying birds like ducks and waders. But generally speaking, you don't know what species they are. Well, <clears throat> has anyone here studied bird migration by radar? OK, well, I have some pictures uh, to show you what the sort of thing you see. That is a, a mobile radar set, uh, and that's in Israel. And the Israel and Israeli biologist uh, managed to buy one of these at the time of the breakup of the Soviet Union. So he bought this top grade military uh, radar for studying bird migration and he also got a Russian guy from the Russian Air Force able to use it. So he got two things for the value of one. But this is, a, a, this is actually what you see uh, on the radar screen. And if you can imagine now, we're sitting down here in the middle this blue line here, that's the coast of Israel. The Mediterranean Sea is there. and This is the land of Israel. And Jerusalem is down here. And all this red stuff here that you can see, this is all migrating birds. And this has taken, uh, the time is up here, that's five past nine in the evening. So it's dark, completely dark outside. And the date is the 1st of April, 2009. Now this radar set, when it, you can set it so that if it detects a bird, it will lock on to it for a period of 10 minutes or 15 minutes, whatever you want, and so that you get the record as a line. So from that line, uh, you, you know the direction that the bird's flying on, and if you set it for 10 minutes, you know the distance the bird flies in 10 minutes. So you can calculate the speed of, of the bird as well. And this, uh, the computer attached to the radar will do this for everything, combine everything. And here are some of the general figures. Uh, this here shows the height of all these birds at this moment. And this is in kilometers above ground level. That's one kilometer up, a thousand meters, two kilometers up. And you can see that on this particular night at this time, most of the birds were flying less than one and a half kilometers above ground level. A few were higher. OK, this is the same data plotted out differently. The other thing that this machine will do is also calculate the directions, the average direction. And that's shown here. The average direction was just to the, uh, <coughs> just to the west of north. Um, but if you look at these separately, look at them carefully, you see that there are two types of directions. Some birds are going that way towards Asia, and other birds are going that way towards Europe, uh, but the machine doesn't distinguish those, it just plot it gives you the average distance which very few birds are actually taking on this occasion. But these are birds, I should have said, that we assume are coming from Africa, migrating up through Israel into Europe and, and Asia. And uh, the other thing it will do is calculate the speed. So this is the distribution of speeds uh, in those birds at that time. And that information, of course, is changing hour by hour through the nights as all the birds uh, move through. So that's, uh, you can see that with that sort of thing you soon get far more data than you can ever deal with, but anyway, it's a very good method of study. And uh, this is a, a situation during the daytime, again in Israel, this is in autumn uh, on the uh, 8th of October 2008. Again, we're sitting in the middle there, that's where the radar is, that's the coast of Israel, and these are migrating birds, but what I want you to notice here is this long line coming down here. That follows the line of the Rift Valley, and those birds are all soaring birds, uh, birds of prey, storks and pelicans that use the updrafts off the sides of the Rift Valley to migrate in a long stream down into Suez and across to Africa. And if you follow it back that way, they go right back to Turkey. Um, and on this particular day, the Israelis had people counting these birds as they flew over because the good thing about soaring birds is that they don't fly as high as other birds and you can actually count them from the ground. And they had a line of observers laying on their backs across the desert, looking up at the birds going overhead and doing counts. And on this one day, they counted 36,000 lesser spotted eagles. That was actually more than the assumed world population passed through Israel in a, a single day, along with a lot of other stuff. So uh, that's radar then is a very useful method of studying uh, bird migration.
And all the radar work has told us what we thought anyway, that birds mostly choose to, to migrate in clear conditions where they can see the sky, the sun or the stars, uh, and also with a following wind, because a following wind blows them in the direction that they want to, to go. And if you can imagine birds like this geese that might be flying, let's say, at 50 kilometers an hour, if they're in a wind that's blowing the same direction also at 50 uh, kilometers an hour, then in theory they could travel at 100 kilometers an hour with respect to the ground, enabling them to halve their travel time or double the distance. Uh, so the importance of wind is, is pretty evident. And those people who watch birds uh, at stopover sites on the coast often notice that if the wind is opposed, it's not a good wind, the birds stay on the ground, they don't fly. They wait for good wind conditions and then they go. Or they go up, they fly up and they sample the wind at different altitudes. But of course wind direction varies with altitude. And if they find the right wind, they go. If they don't, they come back down again. Um, well, uh, regarding the altitude at which birds fly, uh, these are some from three different studies, different parts of the world. Uh, this is the percentage of radar echoes at different altitudes above the ground. And this, these first data here, these are from low ground in Switzerland, where most of the birds on this autumn night were flying, uh, well, this, half of them were probably less than a kilometer above the ground, but some were flying up to three, three kilometers, 3,000 meters. These data here, these were from the south coast of Sweden. And these are birds that have just crossed the Baltic Sea and are flying over the shoreline <coughs> into Sweden. These are mostly ducks and wader, waders heading for the Arctic. And there the general altitude is a lot higher. The average would be about two kilometers. But these are the really interesting ones, I think. This is a set of data <coughs> from a radar set that was on, the sh on a ship in the Caribbean Sea measuring migration as it went over. And these are birds that were assumed to uh, depart from North America, from Canada, Newfoundland and so on, and then strike out over the Atlantic, go down the Atlantic eventually to make landfall in Brazil, in South America. But at this point, they're flying over the Caribbean Sea. And these birds, a big range of altitudes, but some of them are up to six kilometers above sea level. So in general, these birds, mostly passer and songbirds, were flying at much greater altitude. So why do you get so much variation in the altitude at which birds fly? And I just want to show you some data here, great data, from the Gulf Coast of America. And these are birds that have crossed the Gulf of Mexico and they're coming into North America on the, across the coast of Louisiana where the radar station was based. And this is work by a chap called Sid Gorthrow. And what he did was to calculate the altitude that had the greatest density of migrating birds. That's where most birds were. They might be there on one night and up here on another night. And he plotted that. Uh, each of these is a different night. So that's the, the, the altitude of the densest bird migration. And he plotted that in relation to the altitude at which the wind was most favorable. That's a wind in the right direction that the birds want to go and a strong wind blowing them as quickly as possible. And there's a clear, tight relationship as you can see there. In other words, the birds were selecting each night whichever altitude the wind was most favorable. In other words, it was the most energy efficient altitude that the birds were flying at. Um, but of course there are constraints for a bird in flying at high altitude because as the bird climbs higher, obviously the air becomes thinner, there's less oxygen and the temperature falls. And for every kilometer that you travel above the earth, the temperature drops by about seven degrees Celsius. So if you have a bird uh, in England, for example, in autumn, it would take off the typical temperature in October might be five degrees Celsius. But if that bird goes up to just one kilometer <coughs> above the ground, it gets down to minus two. If it goes up to three kilometers, it's minus 16 and so on. <coughs> so the heat loss at high altitudes is great. Um, 
So although the winds may be favourable at high altitudes, there are clearly constraints on birds in flying at those because there are costs involved. <coughs> and in effect, the bird faces a trade-off. It has to balance the energy gained from flight in a favourable wind against the cost of heat production and reduced oxygen availability. Well, for many years, <clears throat> the only information we had on bird movements, as I mentioned, was for either observations or ringing. Um, but uh, as you all know, uh, in recent, uh, well, uh, uh, during the 1990s, uh, the method of satellite tracking uh, became available, which you can attack a, uh, attach a device to a bird and then track it wherever on Earth it goes. The message, of course, the signals are beamed up to satellites which then direct them back to Earth. The problem with the method, well, there are several problems, but one is its expense. It's very uh, expensive. And initially, for the first 10 years or so, uh, most of these transmitters were battery operated. So you had the weight of battery to add to the bird as well. So that limited the size of birds that you could use the method on. But recently, as well, more recently, we have, of course, solar powered ones, which enables you to operate on much smaller birds. That's a small red-footed falcon that's about that big. Uh, that's in, in Hungary. <coughs> that's the solar panels there. But I'm sure you've all seen these and know about them. But uh, it was clear that this method was going to produce remarkable results. And I want to give you, which I think, what I think is the first rec complete record of a raptor, a bird of prey, on migration. And it's a bird that was tagged in France by Bernd Mayberg. It's a short-toed eagle, and he was able to follow the route, the migration, and these dots and the dates here are where that bird stopped to spend each night. It was migrating only during the daytime. Now that's um, quite a remarkable bit of information because it gives you, uh, compared to a single ring recovery, it gives you information on the exact route the bird takes. You know everywhere the bird has stopped, you know how long it's taken over the journey, you know its position on every date, so you have a lot of information on the route itself, you know the altitude of its flight, and you can look at that uh, in relation to weather maps and see whether the bird was affected by weather at all and in what way, and not only that, you can get any one of those locations and you can go to your PC and look on Google Earth and find exactly where that bird spent, the sort of habitat in which the bird spent the night. So uh, that was a tremendous breakthrough in bird migration. And it's also told us about the main hazards that birds face on migration. This is an osprey, and this is uh, from Scotland. And uh, my friend Roy Dennis has tracked a number of these birds, probably 30 or more, on migration. And he's told us, or his results have told us, that ospreys on migration from Scotland die in two main places. One is over the Atlantic, when we have very strong winds from the east, these birds get blown over the sea and they die out at sea. And the second main place where a lot of them die, not surprisingly, is the Sahara Desert, usually towards the southern end of it. Um, so there are two main places of migration and that the reasons for them dying there is fairly obvious. The other interesting finding is that almost all the mortality recorded was on young birds making their first migration. Once they get there and back again, the adults seem to be able to migrate without, uh, I think he's re not recorded any, any mortality at all. Similar pattern for honey buzzards tracked from Sweden and from Scotland. Uh, most of the mortality over sea and in the desert and most of the mortality on juveniles. But some of the uh, radio tracking has told us for some species about previously unknown wintering areas. In other words, it's extended the known geographical range of the birds in Africa. <clears throat> well, I want to now move on to talk about uh, another migrant bird. Yeah, some of you probably know this story because it's so real incredible. And the bird is bar-tailed gotwit, and these birds breed, uh, well, they breed across Asia, but we're talking about the ones that breed in Alaska and eastern Siberia and spend the winter in New Zealand. And now more than 30 of these birds have been uh, radio tracked uh, all the way on migration. And I'm giving the results here. This is off the 
still find it if you want. Um, and uh, this shows the migration of that bird called E7. Um, that's a bird uh, that took off from Alaska up here and flew all the way to New Zealand in a single non-stop flight. That, that the distance was 11,700 kilometers and the bird took uh, eight to eight and a half days over that flight. That's 228 hours of continuous flapping flight uh, with no food, uh, no drink, and uh, obviously navigating fairly effectively over that, and no sleep, of course, over that whole period. The bird spent the winter in New Zealand and then took off again to return to breeding areas, but instead of retracing her autumn route, she took a different route, flying 10,300 <coughs> kilometers to the Yellow Sea on the border between Korea and China. Uh, that journey uh, took longer. Um, it took about uh, seven days or eight days. Um, uh, she was traveling then at about 38 kilometers an hour, a bit slower than that because the wind was against her. She stayed there for about a month, refattened, and then flew six and a half thousand kilometers again back to breeding areas in Alaska. And about 70,000 godwits make that journey every autumn. And they're, of course, they're the longest uh, migrations ever recorded from uh, a land bird. Um, well, the two sort of questions immediately come to mind on this. Uh, one is, uh, how do they manage to, how do they accumulate so much fuel, so much body fat for that flight? And secondly, how do they manage without sleep? Well, at takeoff, it turns out on birds that were shot, that these birds more than double their weight before migration. Some 55% of the body weight of those birds consists of fat uh, to fuel the journey. Uh, but just before takeoff, another remarkable thing happens, and that is that the birds shrink all those body tissues that are not concerned with migration. Uh, the gut, for example, uh, just compresses to a tiny little thread of cotton almost. All the body organs that are not concerned with migration shrink in that way and it goes out of the gut and uh, everything, every other organ of, of, of that sort. But uh, the flight muscles uh, and all the ones that are concerned with flight, they increase. So taking off uh, in a bird like this involves reconstructing the body uh, with the, the flight muscles, the heart and the lungs expanding and all of the body organs shrinking, reducing unnecessary weight to a minimum. So we can see immediately then that birds like this are not like aeroplanes. They don't just land, refuel and take off again. Fattening a bird like that entails reconstructing the whole interior of its body before each major flight. Now regarding sleep, we don't know, as far as I know, we don't know anything about godwits, but what was discovered since this migration is that birds uh, have the ability to rest and sleep one half of their brain at a time, left and then right, and left again. <clears throat> so that raises the possibility that maybe these birds, during migration, uh, operate on just half a brain. They keep swapping on the way to... We don't know that for sure, but at least uh, we know that they would have that possibility. That's rather like the way I drive, by the way. But um, well, All this was discovered by satellite tracking, of course, but the other method, which uh, some of you will be familiar with, is geolocators. Um, these are uh, small gadgets which you fit to the bird, uh, and uh, the information is recorded and carried on the bird, on a data logger on the bird, and then to get the data back, you have to recatch the bird weeks, months, or years later, and download the data to a computer. And people uh, initially uh, have used this uh, quite a lot on seabirds. Um, seabirds, because they're big enough to take it, but also they return to the same site, the same nest site each year, so that you can recatch the same individuals. And what the early geolocators measured was day lengths, the period of light and dark, the dawn and dusk, every day that the tag is on the bird. Now, if you know that, you know the time of dawn and dusk every day, in relation to the time on the breeding areas, you can work out retrospectively when you get the data 
where in the world that bird was on particular dates. You know the longitude because of the time shift and you know the latitude from the day length. But these estimates are of course only very rough and there's a particular problem as you might imagine at the equinoxes when day length is the same 12 hours throughout the world. But I want to give you some examples of these results from this species. This is Manx shearwater uh, which uh, a large number have been ringed uh, or, or banded or, or tagged on an island off the coast of Wales and they were followed on migration, large number of birds and they migrate, Wales is somewhere up there and they migrate down here past Spain, past the coast of Africa, cross the southern Atlantic and spend the winter on the coast off Brazil now in Argentina. Well, we actually knew that from ring recoveries because we do have a few recoveries in each of these places. But what we didn't know is that they take a different route back. Instead of retracing this step back again, they take a different route and right up to Newfoundland area and then cross the Atlantic in the Northern Hemisphere. Now that, if you think about it, matches the wind directions in the two hemispheres. Because in the Northern Hemisphere, the winds go clockwise, so the birds are getting the advantage of wind on all their journey they do there. And in the Southern Hemisphere, the wind goes anti-clockwise, so they get that advantage when they're heading south. And many birds now, seabirds, are known to perform these sort of circular migrations. The, the Godwit was the same, to take advantage of winds at different times. Now you'll see that a lot of these Recorded locations are right across land in Europe and across South America, but this is a seabird. It's not expected to go over land. So what we assume is that these are errors in measurements. You know, if you've got a, 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 a gadget that is measuring the time of dawn and dusk, you could easily imagine that it would get that wrong if it were a very cloudy day or a dark day or something like that. So the errors in these, we assume that all these things are errors in measurements. Uh, but nonetheless, on the scale of this, these errors are relatively small. It still gives us the main pattern of migration in that bird. Um, and of course that technology is developing all the time and we now have tags that you can put on small songbirds, that, that sort of size, as we've, we've been doing sending birds to or tracking birds on migration to Africa. Well, I want to give uh, my last example here. This is a third method using GPS from satellites. Uh, and this, you can get the position accurately to about 100 metres. And I want to talk now about the work of one of my students, uh, Kurt Burnham, who looked at this species in Arctic Greenland. The bird is, in English, it's called a gear falcon. We knew little about the migration of this bird. We know that it nests in the Arctic and we know that birds appear further south in the autumn, occasionally even in northern Britain. But we put uh, satellite tags on the bird. They turned out to be fairly uh, easy to trap uh, and then followed them on their journeys. And in the first autumn, we immediately started getting some totally surprising results. Uh, and I've given the results here for one female bird, a young female bird. And let me just orientate you here. This is Greenland here, labelled Greenland. And this is Iceland here. So this is the North Atlantic. And all these locations are where this bird was on different dates. And it, you can see it spent most of its time at sea. Became a seabird. And we assume, and this is an assumption because we don't know, we assume that the bird is sitting on icebergs, on pieces of ice, and hunting seabirds or sea ducks because that's what it's feeding on. It's a bird-eating falcon. Um, and this is the area over which that bird ranged during its winter, its time away from the breeding area. And its usual practice, if you want to calculate the home range of a bird, you draw a line around the outermost points and calculate the area within it. And we did this for all the birds that fed at sea, and we had several that fed at sea, either here or uh, on the other side of Greenland. And the average area over which these birds are travelling in winter and feeding in winter worked out at 160,000 square kilometres. 
And if you compare that with the home range of a similar sized bird of prey in southern Spain, like a buzzard for example, that would be two to three square kilometers. So there's a real difference in these species. But if you look at these points, we've marked the months in different colors here, you'll see that all the October and November positions are up here. The December ones are down there, January here and February down here. So the bird is moving south during the course of the winter. And what we think are happening, in fact we've looked this with the weather maps, when the, the ice begins to form, of course it's frozen in the north to begin with, and then during the course of the autumn and winter, the ice move pushes further and further south as the sea freezes over. So we assume that what's happening is this ice is pushing the seabirds further and further south, and the falcons are simply following their prey. But they can't follow the ice back again because these birds start nesting in April, late March and April is when they lay their eggs. So at the worst time of year, when they're right down here in the ice, they have to take off and fly back over the ice and re-establish their nest sites in an ice-bound Greenland. And at that time, that's two months before the ice retreats and before any other birds migrate back. So they, at that time of year, Geofalcons falcons have only one creature that they can feed on. That's all that exists there, and that's a ptarmigan, a game bird. I might actually have a picture of it. Yeah, that's what it looks like. And it's been known for, for many years that uh, geofalcons falcons in Iceland and other Arctic areas, their breeding correlates with the population cycles of ptarmigan. Uh, if there's a lot of ptarmigan, they breed well. If there are very few ptarmigan, they breed badly. Well, uh, we now know why, because it's this bird, this is the only thing they can eat for the first half of the breeding cycle. So uh, that's turned up uh, some quite interesting stuff. Um, it, it's another example of how technology is changing our ideas of what birds to do. There's no other way we could get this sort of information. So anyway, I think I'll uh, end at this point. I've just... Uh, hope that uh, the main points I've tried to make is that uh, uh, I think birds are really quite remarkable creatures and they perform feats on migration that to my mind are almost unimaginable. Unimaginable in terms of the distances they travel, the non-stop distances they can go, the altitudes they can reach, the way they store and use energy. And in all these fields we've had huge advantages or advances in recent years and technology is continually providing us with new tools, pushing forward our understanding of what birds are capable of. So for young people in migration research now, this is a really exciting period. So anyway, I'll end at this point. Thank you. Yeah. Is time for questions?